Hello and welcome. This is a video that uh, I'm sure a lot of people are going to disagree with me, but I've mentioned this a lot in my videos, and I just kind of wanted to try to explain it. And I'm going to do the whole where I'm going to draw. You know, you see people do this. I've never done a video like this before, but I'm going to try to do this in one take and draw stuff. It's going to be messy, but hopefully you'll follow along. And my point of today's video is why antivirus doesn't work, why it doesn't even make sense, and uh, why your systems do things better than antivirus does already. So first of all, let's talk about the history of antivirus, right? Uh, you had a crazy man, right? This is this is a crazy man. <laughs> uh, McAfee, right? Uh, John, John McAfee, I believe was his name. He's passed away since. He was a crazy man. You can look up videos of him online. He was uh, uh, a crazy, paranoid man, most likely a murderer. And uh, he, being paranoid, got other people paranoid and got them to buy his antivirus software. And we say antivirus, right? AV. Uh, but really, when we say antivirus, we're talking about something that protects against malware. Now, malware and virus, a virus is a type of malware, but not all malware is viruses. Just to be clear, a virus is a program that is malicious and copies itself to other systems. Back in the day, it was with floppy disks, right? Uh, there would be a program on here. You put it in your computer when you ran it. It copied it to your system. So let's say this is your laptop here, right? Or laptop, desktop here. It copied there. And then when you put in a new floppy disk, it copied itself over to that. And then so when someone put this in their computer, it copied it over. Nowadays, you know, it would do it through the internet, through the cloud, you know. So you get a virus on your system and then it uses your email client, right? Whatever you do to uh, look at your contacts and email them a file. That's that's a little less likely now. A lot of email uh, servers will block executables, but there's still ways to do it. They might send links to executables that people download and run. So a virus copies itself. Malware is just a piece of software that is going to do something malicious. So what is malicious? What I consider malicious, you may not consider malicious. We each consider different things malicious. For me, my definition to, to simplify it down is a piece of software, so I'm just gonna say exe here, so an executable, that either does something that the owner of a device does not want to do or prevents the owner of that device from doing something they want to do. So for example, let's say, and there's really no way, again, for antivirus to know what you want done on your system. So let's say I have a directory. Look, this is a folder here with a little tab, right? And in there, I have log files for whatever my system. I have log files. But I want a program to run uh, every so often and look and find any file, any log that's more than maybe seven days old, 30 days old, whatever. And I want it to delete that file. You know, any files that are over, older than seven days, delete them. I don't want them filling up my hard drive, delete them. How does a an antivirus program know that this program is supposed to be deleting those? Because you get an executable that goes through and starts deleting files on your system. That could be malicious if you, this is you, as the owner of the device, doesn't want it doing that. So to, for me, malicious software, it's intentionally doing something that the owner of that device does not want it to do. And again, it's intentional. So like if I install a program that is supposed to go and it's clear that it's supposed to go and delete old log files, that's not malicious. If I didn't know it was supposed to do that, that's my fault for not understanding what that program does. But if it's not supposed to be doing that and it does, that's malicious. Or for me also, if me as the owner of the device, and not just a user, the owner of the device, because as, a, as the owner of the device, I could put restrictions on other users, but as the owner of the device, if there's a piece of software that's preventing me from doing something, maybe changing what the, the boot screen looks like on my phone, right? You have a little animation, I should be able to change that. If a piece of software doesn't let me do that, this is my device, I should be able to do whatever I want, I consider that malicious. So by definition, I personally think any proprietary software or anything that's not free and open source, or at least open source, for me, that would be malicious, right? Because um, it's preventing me from changing that code, preventing me from making it, making changes to it. You may not define it like that. So how does antivirus uh, look and try to discover what is malicious software, right? Malware. How does it do it? Well, there's a number of ways, but for the most part, it's just guessing. <laughs> you know, it's, we don't know, it just guesses. So it could look at a file, right? So there's ways to determine if two files are the same. One day, one way is it like a uh, MD5 hash, you know, so MD5 sum. 
I'm not saying that this is how antivirus initially does it, but this is one way to determine whether two files are the same. You, you run a file through that and it gives you some output, one, two, three, four. And no matter wherever you copy this file to, it will always give you that same output. So you know those files are the same. So a, an antivirus software could probably back in the day, it did something like that and it looked and goes, okay, uh, check for any file that has that because only the same exact file should have that in theory. Uh, the thing is, you change one bit in a file and it's going to give you a completely different uh, checksum, right? Clear this. Uh, so if I was to in, let's say I'm writing something in C and I was to then go back and change the code and let's say I just, I have a printf function in there, right? And it said, it just said dot, it was a period, right? If I go in there and now change that to an exclamation mark, that doesn't change the rest of the program, but it's going to give you a completely different checksum, right? Instead of one, two, three, four, it will be A, B, C, D. So all I have to do is change one little bit in my program, add one little line of code, or even just modify something. I can just do exclamation mark, exclamation mark. It's going to give you a completely different checksum number than the previous one did. And that's just one way, not just changing your code, but if you use a different compiler, uh, it's going to compile the code different and you're going to get a completely different checksum number. So it's very easy to hide your code, but you can also encrypt stuff. There's just a number of ways to make uh, your program different. You could also something, so it, it's not going to be able to tell that two files are the same because it's very easy to make two files completely different for checks like that. Uh, it can try to pick apart the executable. And again, you can encrypt stuff and have encryption keys in your executable, which is normal for non-malicious software to do. So uh, antivirus can't just look at it and go, oh, there's encryption key, this is malicious software. It can try to guess at that, and that's why antivirus virus software guesses wrong so often, more often than it actually finds viruses. Um, but like, if I was uh, manually picking apart an executable, I could look at things and I could um, decompile it uh, into, um, assembly code, and if I'm familiar with assembly code, I can look through and try to figure out what this program's doing, but uh, antivirus software is gonna have issues doing that. I could also, just as someone who maybe doesn't know much about assembly, I could always run strings on an executable, right? Strings is a command that's on your uh, Linux system already. I'm pretty sure it's on all systems. It's just one of those core commands. And what happens is you, you, you take uh, any file and you pipe into strings or give it to strings, and it's gonna print out all uh, ASCII, all typable characters, right? So let's say I'm not very good at writing malicious software, and I just run something like a uh, OS system, and I just pass it a shell command, and I just give it rm-rf forward slash, right? which is gonna to try to erase everything on your hard drive, although if it doesn't have root or sudo, it's only gonna get that user's files. Um, but I could run it on strings and I could look for this string. I can go, oh, that will, it'd be very easy for me to encrypt that or even just encode it with something like base64, right? You run base64 and let's say it gives you an output of one, two, three, four. Well, all I have to do is come in here and I can change my code to a semicolon there and now it's gonna get give me A, B, C, D. Again, very easy for me to hide things. So antivirus can try to look for things, but it's very easy to hide things. So it's just guessing. And that's kind of my point is antivirus is just guessing at what is malicious and not. Uh, besides looking for the exact same file, so if we know for a fact that something has been considered malicious, you can look for that exact same file. But again, files, uh, executable files can, every time they run and they copy themselves, uh, they can modify themselves and you're gonna get a different checksum number. So it's very hard to determine whether these two programs are gonna do the exact same thing just by looking at the file. You're guessing unless you're manually picking it apart, reverse engineering it, looking at the assembly and going through it step by step. An antivirus doesn't do that. Now you might be thinking, well, how do I protect myself? Uh, control A, delete. Um, well, the simplest way, and there's no perfect way, for me, I have three standards. Do I trust the software, right? The program I want, do I trust it? And my standards for trust are gonna be different than yours. But for me, it definitely, I would definitely want it to be open source or preferably free and open source software, right? Because again, I already said, if it's 
uh, proprietary software I, and can't see the code, well then I don't know what it's doing. There is no way you can try to backwards engineer it and maybe you'll, you, if you're really good, you can get the assembly code from it. You can do that with most executables and then go through it step by step as assembly. Uh, but really for me, the only reason to not share the source code is because you're hiding something. That's just that's just how it is. You're, you're hiding something. Maybe you're not trying to do something malicious, but you're trying to hide something. That's why you don't share the code. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm perfect. I mean, I, I definitely have had uh, drivers on my system in the past uh, that are, are not open source. So it's not a perfect world, but I try to stick to free and open source software. So I, I, I try to pick software I only trust and you have to get it from a trusted source. So not just that you trust the software for whatever standards you have, but you're trusting the server it's coming from, which is most likely where you're getting your software, and you're trusting that it's coming to you safely. So I'm writing key here for you know encryption. There's encryption keys or checks to make sure that you got it and there was no man in the middle preventing you from getting what you actually think you're getting. So I trust the software for whatever standards, and again, your standards are gonna be different than mine. And I trust where I'm getting it from and how I'm getting it. Okay, so you might go, okay, uh, so I personally try, try, and again, it's not a perfect world. I try to stick as much as I can to the Debian repositories, right? And I, I trust that the developers, the maintainers there go through the code. Now you might go, Chris, we just had that vulnerability in XZ that affected SSH. Yeah, so that went through. And you know what? In the almost 20 years I've been using Linux, this is the first time I have ever heard of malicious software getting into the repositories of Debian, or really uh, I've heard of any distribution. Uh, it's definitely possible, as we saw. But because it was open source, it was quickly found by someone who wasn't even a security specialist. If it wasn't open source, and he had to backwards engineer it and look, in, look at the, uh, the assembly, we may have not caught it so fast. But we caught it, and... Uh, and right away, so on my systems, on my servers, I run Debian stable. So with Debian, and I'm not, I'm just using this as an example because I use Debian. I am not saying it is the only distribution anyone should use, but they have what's called unstable, unst <laughs> that's it, unstable testing. Love my handwriting here. Testing, that says testing. And then we have stable. And on my servers, I always run stable, but on my main machine here, my wife's machine, my kid's machine, and the machine that's hooked up to my TV, I actually run SID, which is unstable. And SID, see, if you're running stable, you are not affected by XC because everything's got to go through stable and then through testing, and it takes a while for it to get to stable. That's why you use stable for important things, right? Your software might be a little bit older, but it's been thoroughly tested. So I, I don't even think testing was affected by XC. My machines were affected. But you know what, by the time I heard about this, by the time we all heard about it, Debian already went and they, they rolled back to a previous version that didn't have the vulnerability in it. And that's been the case anytime there's been a vulnerability. And so this is the first time I've heard of malicious software getting in repositories, but there's been bugs in code before, like back in the day with, with let me draw a heart here, heart bleed. Let's draw a little blood coming out of the, the heart here, right? with heart bleed and there's been a number of bugs. Antivirus doesn't fix bugs, right? Um, as soon as I've heard about any vulnerability, I read about it online. I just run my package manager, apt update, and then apt upgrade. And I watch the packages being installed and they've always, by the time I've heard about it, they've already fixed it. And that's the thing. It's even with something like this, okay, let's say with XZ, there was a encryption key that was embedded in that, that would allow the person who put it in there to have access to means, machines through SSH. So theoretically, antivirus, you could have an antivirus software that scanned your computer and looked for that key in all files and if it found it, it could quarantine or delete it. Thing is, we had to have known about it first. And by the time we know about it, if you have a decent distribution, and you keep your software up to date, it should already be fixed. The antivirus is gonna to be too late. I mean, theoretically, I guess antivirus, they could have found it and added it to the list of antivirus stuff, and you could have checked that maybe a little bit before uh, it was pushed out to your to your um, distros, but most likely not. Once a, a vulnerability is found, if you have a decent distribution that's being maintained, it's gonna be pushed and fixed. And you know what? If it's not being well maintained, then you may have not even got the 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 uh, the, the 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 virus, the ma malware. Um, 
So yeah, in this case where maybe we know what to look for, if we know what to look for, your distribution should fix it as long as you're, you're getting your software from, uh, oh, got a little message here. Um, so yeah, so once we know about something, your system should take care of it. But what we're talking about when we say this, we're talking about what's called zero day attacks, right? Zero day attacks are new vulnerabilities. Uh, they could be uh, usually a, a bug in a software or maybe a piece of malicious software that was just found that was pushing stuff. And the thing is antivirus doesn't protect you from zero day attacks, right? So the only way for a, a, a virus to get onto your system is for you, this is you, right? You're very happy over here doing your thing. This is your computer, right? Get a little floppy drive there and we'll give you a, a keyboard. For this executable, this virus to get onto your system, you have to download it and not just download it, but run it, right? So as long as you're not downloading stuff you don't trust, that shouldn't be an issue. And yeah, maybe you'll make mistakes, but the thing is antivirus, again, isn't gonna find it. Now, can a virus get onto your machine without you downloading and running it besides someone else getting onto your machine and putting in a, a CD or a USB drive or something like that? Uh, theoretically, but the only way that would happen out, outside of someone else doing it, maybe uh, someone else's machine is infected and you plug in a, a USB flash drive, right? and it gets onto your USB flash drive, then you plug that USB flash drive into your system. Can that program now execute on your system? It shouldn't be able to. You shouldn't be able, executable should not be able to run without you saying to run it, right? You manually running it. Or there's a vulnerability on your system that is uh, running uh, executables on your system without you knowing. And again, if that's happening, the issue isn't the, the malware. We have to already have a vulnerability in your system. So, and if, if there's a vulnerability that we know about, we've already talked about, your distro should fix that right away. If it isn't fixed right away, then you need to switch distros, right? And if we don't know about it, it's a zero day attack. And again, antivirus is not going to know about it. So again, what antivirus does, a lot of times is what it appears like, it's just guessing. It looks at, and it's, so here's the cloud, right? The internet, that's what the cloud is, the internet. And they might see, it might see an executable and it's trying to download a file. And it can go, oh, oh, this program's downloading a file. It must be a virus. I've seen that happen before. Programs hooked to the internet. So many executables do things with the cloud. Now, if it shouldn't be doing that, then that's your fault for installing a piece of software that's doing something that it shouldn't, right? Um, so that means that's what it's supposed to be doing. For antivirus to come and go, oh, you, it shouldn't be downloading stuff. Well, no, if that program, if you trust this program, then it, it should be doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is downloading something. Maybe a program tries to open up a port on your system because it's running some sort of service. Maybe you want to be able to remote into your machine and you're using something to do that. I mean, I recommend SSH, which clearly recently there was a little issue with that, but SSH is, is always gonna be your best option for remote access to your system. Um, but let's say you, you wanna use something else. Maybe you're using some sort of VNC or maybe you wrote something yourself. For antivirus, they're gonna go, oh, this program's trying to open up a port, block it. No. No, if I install a piece of software and it's trying to open a port, that's what it's supposed to be doing because I trust this software. It's the only reason it's on my system. If it's on my system without me knowing it got there by some third party, someone physically accessing my machine or by some vulnerability on my system that hasn't been detected and patched yet, which again is a zero day attack. So, so I guess, I guess theoretically, if I have some sort of vulnerability that we don't know about, which again, if, if, if we don't know about it, most people don't know about it, it's a zero day attack. You could be attacked with most times these zero day attacks. Most people don't know about them, so they're not you know, attacking you, but let's say they are. Let's say one's attacking you because of vulnerability on your system. Theoretically, it could push some sort of malware onto your system that antivirus is detected. But again, it would have to be something that it knew about, right, ahead of time. Just guessing that it's opening a port or downloading a file is, is, not, is not good enough. It's gonna give you more false positives or false, yeah, false positives.
So, so what did we learn today, right? Your computer can only get software on it if you put it on it or if there's a, a vulnerability on your system that isn't patched. A vulnerability on your system that isn't patched, antivirus is not going to be able to help you because we don't know about it. Once we know about it, you should do an update. And if you have a decent operating system, that should be fixed, right? There is no way that antivirus can know what you consider malicious. So all it's going to do is going to guess. And I've seen this happen so many times. I'll write a piece of software. I'll go plug it into a Windows machine. And sometimes it's just been, there was one point a couple of years ago where GCC, which is one of the top used compilers in the world, uh, if I compiled, cross compiled something on Linux for Windows, it doesn't matter if it was a hello world application that just had a main function and printed hello world. Anything that I compiled, uh, the Windows built-in, whatever it's called, antivirus software, was flagging it. And not only was it flagging it, if I put it on a flash drive and brought it over there and plugged the flash drive in, it would delete it off the flash drive. Which is just crazy to me because because what if I needed that executable? What if that was my only copy and they just deleted it? Uh, and there was nothing. It was stuff I wrote and just and it was eventually fixed. It was eventually fixed. It had nothing to do with GCC. It had to do with their uh, antivirus software that's built into Windows, Windows Defender, I think it's called. And, and I've seen that happen so many more times where it blocks, deletes, removes, quarantines, stuff that I know isn't malicious that I wrote myself. But for some reason, whether I'm opening a port or downloading a file. And you know what's funny is I've had that happen before where I write a piece of software and it goes to download a file and it goes, oh, no, no, it's trying to download a file. This is a virus. Well, I try to download that same exact file, but using a different method in the code, and it, and it didn't flag it, which doesn't make any sense. I'm downloading the same file, so it wasn't even the URL that it was going, oh, you go into this web server. It was the same one, and and it, it flagged my software, my script. I think it was a PowerShell script as malicious, but then I just used a different, I rewrote the function for downloading, and it, and it didn't flag it. The program was doing the same exact thing. And again, uh, there's going to be a lot of people who argue with me on this, but antivirus, it, my point of this video is it just doesn't make sense. There's no way for a program to know that another program is malicious. Besides, again, something that we all know for a fact has been deemed malicious, and we have a list of those. But again, it, it's as simple as using, you know, going from GCC to G++ or uh, what's... Uh, bloodshed which actually uses a different version of GCC like uh, on Windows it was like mini GCC or something but if you use a different compiler you're going to get different output for your executable that is going to show up as a different file and you can also just modify because again changing one bit of an application is going to change how the program looks if you're looking running some sort of checksum on it and again trying to look at the file like with strings or something like that, which again, I'm not saying that's how antivirus does it, but if you're just trying to pick apart what's in it, it's very easy to encode or encrypt and ex executables will change themselves. They will copy a new copy of themselves and modify themselves on the copy and then delete the original. So every time this file is execute, this malicious software it moves to another system, it looks different. There's no way for antivirus to understand what it is. and you know, it could look at, oh, what is it trying to do? And again, how does it know it's malicious? But you could have uh, malicious software do multiple different things and wait for certain triggers, maybe a certain number of days, maybe a certain number of reboots. Um, maybe it's just random. Maybe every time it runs, it just runs a random check, you know, a number one through 10. And if it's ever the number eight, then execute, you know? And if not, so it, it's hard to determine this stuff. So... That's all I have to say. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to touch on. But feel free to disagree with me in the comments below. Uh, and I also want to make clear that I'm not saying that I don't have to worry about viruses because I'm on a Linux system. Writing software for Linux is a lot easier than writing software for Windows. Uh, and so it'd be easier to write malicious software. 
it, it's the fact is that downloading executables you don't trust from places you don't trust in ways you don't trust is how you get a virus uh, or malware and uh, I trust the Debian repositories and again they're not perfect but in 20 years that I've been using or I guess it's been 18 years that I've been using Linux uh, the first time I ever heard of malicious software getting through uh, to the Debian repositories was with XZ and it was quickly found and removed and bugs in the past have been quickly removed so there's no such thing as a perfect system for security but my point is antivirus oh antivirus also has to constantly be running in the background right so it's eating up your system resources right here's here's your, a bar for your memory and a bar for your cpu and it's just eating up some of that that doesn't need to it's also accessing your hard drive to look at files and so it's going to be eating up your your read write speeds for your hard drive so you're running a program in the background that's just going to use up some of your system resources to do nothing but give you false positives right so thanks for watching filmsbychris.com uh, check out my website and the link in the description I thank you for watching if you disagree with me comment below if you do agree with me comment below and as always I just hope that you have a great day